All right, everybody, we're running late, but we are now, I am now calling our regular meeting to order. A recording and or broadcast of this meeting is being made at the direction of the board, which may capture images and sounds of those attending the meeting. Start by calling the roll. Steve? Here. Vladimir? Present. Shali? Here. Jessica? Here. I'm also here. All <coughs> trustees are in attendance. We'll move on to the Pledge of Allegiance. Are there some Covington coyotes that would like to lead the Pledge of Allegiance? Excellent, please. Stand up and proceed. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. We go on to D3, agenda approval. Would any board members like to provide comment on the agenda? Would anyone like to make a motion to approve the agenda? So moved. I'll second. Motion to approve the agenda made by Vladimir, seconded by Shali. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes, five nothing. Closed session report. Uh, no action was taken in closed, no reportable action was taken in closed session. B5, superintendent's update. All right. Well, a few things for you, but I would love to start by telling everyone and each of you that we heard on Friday that both Block and Egan have earned the California Distinguished School Award. Amazing. This round is um, the eligibility is for middle schools and high schools. There was a handful of schools within our county. Um, of course, you remember last round, um, the vast majority of our elementaries got that distinction. Uh, so we're really excited. And it's a great way, I see Ms. Fulmore over there, a great way to uh, celebrate the good work for our students and our staff. So it's really outstanding. And we'll be celebrating them down in um, Disneyland in May oh, for nice. the, the award ceremony. Um, in other news, we are starting our facilities master planning workshop. So we had um, a district meeting and maybe later or now Steve wants to share a little bit about our district team meeting to prepare for those site level meetings. But each of our sites over the next three or four weeks We'll be having a facilities master planning input session um, this week. I believe we begin, I'm not sure the exact order, Oak and Gardner Bullis. Um, and then we'll be making our way through the schools. Um, we've asked for some representation across the school community from parents to a variety of staff members, perhaps some older students to participate. Um, and we'll be um, sharing with them kind of the standards that we hope to build across all of our schools for real modern school learning. Um, and then as you all know, each of our schools is in a different place. So perhaps some input around what are the priorities for this school should we have to do work in phases. So that's exciting. Um, we have our STEM expos last one day last week, I made it over to Loyola. They were our first school to start their STEM Expo. Uh, this week, we have Springer and Santa Rita on a Wednesday evening, if you're available, 5.30 to 7. Uh, it is mind-boggling <laughs> what our kids are doing around STEM Expo. It's really outstanding, so I encourage you to attend if you are able to. And then um, also wanted to let you know that Marcy continues to work with the City of Los Altos staff um, around getting a solidifying a date for our uh, city schools oh, meeting. Yeah. So we're playing back and forth, yeah. um, catch the date type of thing, but that is certainly um, something that we're working toward and might likely not be until later this spring, just with the timing. Um, and then we have a minimum day this Thursday. So our elementaries get out at 12.15 and our junior highs at 12.30. So our teachers have some time to do some um, self-directed learning and work, which is a great day for them on Thursday. That is it for my update right now. Thank you. We'll move on to E1, the Covington School presentation. Yes. Uh, Mr. Armstrong. Thank you for coming. Uh, <laughs> um, 
Kevin Armstrong, very proud principal of Covington Elementary. Um, first off, thank you all for giving me my job because I love it here. Um, but I really appreciate this time. But you don't, you're not here to see me, right? We want to see our kiddos talk about um, our leadership program. Uh, it's very, it's a different model, right? It's not a traditional student council, but I love the things that they're doing. And my job is to empower staff to do the things they really care about with students. So with that being said, I would love to bring up Michelle Gibo and Colton Lasse so they can introduce our amazing students. Thank you again for having us here tonight before our leaders jump into their amazing presentation, which they have worked so hard on. We just want to share a little bit about how we made the transition from a traditional student council model to our leadership program. And so throughout COVID, it seems years ago, right? But not having our student council on campus um, because of virtual learning and then cohorts, we thought it was the perfect time to bring it back, but to also think about ways in which we could revamp it to be even more inclusive and meaningful and impactful for all of our students. So we were really lucky that we got to learn a bit from Springer because they also made this leap as well to establish a leadership program. So we worked with them. We were also very fortunate to have the support of our former principal, Wade Minator, last year. Let us get this going. And then, of course, our current principal, Kevin Armstrong, to really encourage us to keep this going. So, thank you. But most importantly, all of our amazing leaders that are here tonight. Okay, and I'll just piggyback on that really quickly. But before I introduce um, the presenters that you're going to hear from, I would like to give credit to all of our leadership students. So, I'm going to ask you all to stand up. Um, we are so honored to have 25 students this year. And for the sake of time, you're only going to hear from a small portion of them, but they are all equally awesome. So tonight we have two sixth graders with us, Adelina and Ancon. Go ahead, go ahead and wave your hand. You wave your hand. And so, sorry, sorry, sorry. I just want you to have fifth grade forever, but you're not. Okay. We have three sixth graders. I'm so sorry. Adelina, Sophie, and Ancon. And then we also have two fifth graders. That will hopefully will return next year. That's the plan. Um, Talia and Surya presenting to you. So enjoy. You're in for a treat. The first thing that Covington Leadership would like to talk to you tonight is about how we've developed as leaders. One thing we do in the beginning of the year is we make leader versus bosses posters. In these posters, we define what makes a leader and what makes a boss. In the leader side of the poster, we might see things like listens first. But in the boss side of the poster, we might see things like talks first. These posters help us become better leaders and make sure that we aren't being a boss. One of our favorite activities we did this year was the blindfold challenge. In this challenge, there was a leader and a follower. The follower was blindfolded. It was the leader's job to navigate the follower around obstacles without touching he or she. For example, they could say two steps forward or three steps to the right, making it so they made it around these obstacles safely. We had so much fun from these challenges and we learned so much. So we would like it for you, we would like it for you guys to be able to try it tonight too. We have two volunteers from the board that can help us show this challenge. <laughs> Sorry guys, I told them to look in. Who would like to be blindfolded? <laughs> All right. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so you know they're they're. Don't hit my eye. Yeah. 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 Oh God. <laughs> so it's your job to make it make sure that he gets around this obstacle course safely, and if he falls, we're gonna blame it on you. Oh, <laughs> sorry. All right. Sorry. Um, All right, you can start whenever you're ready, and you can remember you can only use your words like two steps forward. Hmm. <laughs> yeah. Uh, three steps forward. Stop. Um, pick up your uh, left foot. Uh, uh, up. It, you're going to be stepping mm, stepping over the thing, so pick it up. You want to feel for an obstacle. 
but the other point is the one that's yeah yes sorry <laughs> close enough oh all right pick up the other foot there you go all right and because he's supposed to make it to the next uh uh around the chair around oh my god <laughs> uh, one big step to the uh right uh one smaller one and then three steps forward <laughs> um and i don't know this one's hard for um step back a tiny bit and then <laughs> Why? Why? Small steps to your left, and uh, one to be and step forward, <laughs> and then another step, and then you're in. <laughs> I don't know about the chair either. <laughs> We're going to use this in our next retreat. <laughs> what we got out of this activity and what we hope you got out of this activity is team building skills and trusting others. One of the great things about having to impact on our community, throughout the year, leadership leads at different activities for all grade levels, such as the, the Bingo for Book, Spirit Days, this October activity, the LAES Festival, the Spirit Week before JO, and more. We make sure to have activities for all grade levels, even if the event is geared uh, more towards the specific grades. And so since leadership has started, we've expanded our efforts outside of school to the greater community. Last year, we held a hot cocoa sale where we donated $522 to the St. Jude Children's Hospital. We also had a sweet dreams pajama drive where the kids brought in um, new pajama sets and we donated those to the Sacred Heart Community Center. Mm -hmm. This year we had a Softober sock drive where we donated 324 pairs also to the Sacred Heart Community Center. And just recently in December, we had a cookie decorating sale and we got uh, we raised $550 to donate to the American Cancer Society. And so before we hold our events, uh, we always get together as a group and we discuss about what charity we would like to raise money for, and then we all vote on what we think would be the best charity. And so it's also important that we advertise for um, our events, and so we make posters and flyers, and we also take pictures of them and put them on the Covington Howler so that um, all the parents also know what's going on. So, as leaders, learn through our leadership some future opportunities and some new skills that we can uh, work throughout our the rest of our life. Uh, one skill that we learned is organization. Um, we can use that to plan events, and we also learned how to manage our time. We can manage our time when doing projects, like taking some time out of our day and working on those. <clears throat> and we also have short sessions in leadership. So we have, um, we exercise this um, uh, idea of like managing our time so we can effectively overcome obstacles. And we learn how to divide and conquer. In other words, we can overcome obstacles more effectively by splitting up into groups and focusing on one little thing to then um, uh, finish the entire project or whatever we're doing. We also learn the skill of collaboration, where we can work with our peers, which what we did uh, over the past two weeks to create this presentation. And we can include everyone in the project, which all of leadership created this, this. And we share our ideas to do multiple things. Another, another skill we learned is kindness. Like if we see somebody not involved or not participating as much, then we can include them by giving them a specific task so they can like be included and work on whatever we're doing. We also wanna make sure that everybody is feeling welcome and it'll be an overall more fun experience to everybody. We have also learned about community service, like when we do our drives or spirit days and like Sophie um, elaborated on. And also um, we can spread kindness by and our new and improved skills 
by leading by example, speaking to people, just like in this meeting, and Ankhan will also talk to you more about that. And we always keep in mind what are our skills so we can use them wherever we go. <clears throat> As Syria kind of introduced, oh, we also learn the skill of public speaking, which is what we're doing right now. <laughs> we can speak in front of our class and it gives us more confidence uh, because we are generally more prepared uh, for things that might happen in other life. We can, it'll help us in junior high, high school, college, and even our career. Thank you, and this is coming to you. Thank you. Any follow-up questions from my fellow board members? No. Good presentation. Yeah. Great presentation. Thank you for participating. No interview. Well, they're the real estate girls that you guys model. That's uh, awesome. Thank you. Could our leaders take a picture with all of you? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. You guys want to come up around behind us? Maybe? Sure. That way they can avoid the camera. Yeah. 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 Watch the board. Watch the board. They want to take that out. Yeah. You want to get yeah. that out yeah. 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 earlier? Yeah. 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 All right, we, just, we ask everybody who's leaving, leave quickly and quietly. We will move on to our consent calendar item. <laughs> yeah. Would any board members like to provide comment on the consent calendar? <laughs> consent calendar, any comments? No. Would like to make a motion to approve the consent calendar? So I'll second. Motion to approve the consent calendar made by Vladimir, seconded by Shali. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Yeah. Motion passes five nothing. Moving on to G1, play request to address the board. Uh, Chris Hazel, uh, not Chris Hazel. Uh, I'm speaking on behalf of CSEA today, just quickly oh. about that we have several employees who are up today for their positions being eliminated. And we just wanted to address you and everyone publicly to say thank you to all of those employees for their amazing work and being part of CSEA the last several years. It's both custodians and our district wellness coordinator. And both of those are positions that deeply touch our students and really have added to the effectiveness of our schools and that it is always hard to say goodbye to employees, but we'd like to recognize their amazing work and how much we appreciate them. Thank you. Um, any further employees? Chris and Lord? Did that cover everybody? Yeah, Chris is not here today. Gotcha. Okay. Um, we we'll move on to community comments. Um, to provide comment on an agenda item tonight, speaker cards are to be submitted to the superintendent. Speaker cards will not be accepted once public comment begins on an item. Your name will be announced when it's your turn to speak. Speaker cards can be found over there. Um, H, community comments. This time is reserved for members of the public and employees to address the board on items that are not on the agenda. Board is not permitted to discuss or take action on non-agenda items except to instruct the superintendent to review the matter further. Report back to the board at a subsequent meeting or place the matter on a future agenda. The board may make a brief comment or ask clarifying questions. Do we have any speakers for items not on the agenda? Seeing none, we'll move on to action and discussion items. I1, inspiring leaders updates. Dr. Bosco. <laughs> Okay, good evening. Uh, we're so excited to give you a brief update 
about the district's aspiring leaders program, and we have a few participants joining us. Um, but Connie's going to get us started and just talk a little bit more about the the approach and the goals for the program. Um, well, first of all, I, have, I don't know that I've had this privilege before, like standing up here. I've done a lot of things in this district, but not this. This is pretty exciting. <laughs> um, so earlier in the year, I was approached by um, Carrie and, and and sort of by Sandra to to think about having a, an opportunity for staff to think about potential leadership opportunities. Um, and as a person that is closer to the end of their career than to the beginning, um, I was actually thrilled and thought it was uh, super awesome. Um, I had some really great mentors in a previous district I worked in and in this district, um, as many of you know, because you've been here almost as long as I have, um, the Brenda Dykemans, the Bruce McLeans, the Jeff Bears, the Sandra McGonigals of the world, the Steve Talios that have... <laughs> that have mentored me through my process. Um, I thought it was a really great move to, to give uh, some of our um, our folks that maybe haven't had that opportunity, that opportunity. So I appreciate being um, incorporated into that. It was really cool because it was open to anyone who was interested. It wasn't, um, there was no shoulder tapping. Well, except for this one. Um, <laughs> but it, it really was open to all and anyone who wanted to participate. Um, uh, folks are giving up their time to come after school. Uh, and there's some mentoring opportunities, some shadowing, and a lot of networking. Uh, we've met a few times already this year, and there'll be a few more after school. Um, and it's it's been awesome, and it's it's a great opportunity, I think, to build capacity from within uh, rather than always looking without. And I think that's been a really uh, a really cool process. Uh, I was often pushed in my previous role before this district and in this district from within, and I didn't always take the opportunities I was given. And so it's nice to be able to sort of pass that forward and to pay that forward. Uh, I would not be in the position I'm at. I'm in without the the folks that have sort of pushed in and encouraged. And I think sometimes some of the really great leaders that we have out there need that little push um, just to get them going. So I'm um, we've developed sort of a, a shared vision of what this could look like, and I appreciate that. I appreciate being included. And I am so thrilled with the folks that have chosen to join us. Uh, I have learned so much from them. Uh, the very first time we met, uh, we did this exercise talking about um, sort of your greatest influence. Um, and it ended up being a lot more emotional, I think, than a lot of us thought it was going to be. But uh, it was also very authentic and very genuine. And um, and I, it's just been a great opportunity. So I appreciate that. And I thank all of those that have chosen to participate. So I'm going to have our participants introduce themselves. We have 21 folks that are in our cohort. Um, so a really nice mix of people from both the junior high and the elementary. But here this evening, I'm going to have uh, our three participants just introduce themselves and tell you where they're, they're at and what they teach. I'm Jen Patino. I teach um, business history, leadership, and Abbott at um, Beacon. I'm Dana Hardister, and I teach TSCC at Beacon. I'm Josh Molsness, and I teach eighth grade English and leadership at the block. Thank you. So Connie mentioned meeting number one. It was about our why. So why as a district are we running this group? And then why are the participants interested in participating? And so we asked everybody to bring an object from home to introduce themselves and um, someone in their family that had been a, a leader or an inspiration to them. And so each of us introduced ourselves that way, our why, and what, what drives us to be leaders. Um, and then we surveyed them. What what do they want to get out of, of this group? What would, what would they like to learn more about when we think about the district and the wheel, the initiatives around the wheel? Um, if we had a panel of principals, what would they like to ask them about the, the, the role, really? Um, and then EL on the DO. The that was awesome. The download on the DO, the district office. What do you really want to know about <laughs> um, what it's like to to work and live at the district office, and then just leadership moves. What what are you interested in learning more about? And so, the right is just some feedback we got after that first meeting from participants, and our folks will just talk about that a little bit later. But in general, just um, an appreciation for the space to learn a little bit about what it it means to be a leader, but also just to learn about what's going on in the district, TK through eighth grade. So you'll hear a little bit more about that this evening. Um, meeting number two is that principal panel. We had the folks come in and, and answer the questions that were posed by our aspiring leaders. And then meeting three, um, some of our district office folks came in. 
And then meeting number four, we got into what does the wheel look like um, in LASD TK through eighth grade? So thinking about each of the domains um, that we want to see in classrooms when we're, when we're walking through, what does it look like? Um, and really chew on that from a vertical horizontal alignment standpoint. And then coming soon are our, our meetings five and six where we're going to get into leadership moves, scenarios for practice, and then opportunities for um, them to try out some different um, leadership opportunities. So I'm gonna hand it over to Okay, can I finish? So um, I'm the first one up there. So for me, um, coming to the, the aspiring leaders, I was really looking for um, the opportunity to kind of learn how our district is organized and how the inner workings work. Um, you don't always get to see those pieces. And so just who does what and how does it all like um, become symbiotic together? So that was a piece that, that was interesting to me. Um, and then from the sessions, the piece that I really enjoyed is we've spent a lot of time learning about the wheel this year, but kind of hearing its origin story and how it started and then seeing how it plays out across all the different grade levels across the district was a really interesting piece for me to kind of get to see and make all the different connections and how in middle school, how what they've gone through before they get to us and how all the pieces fit together in the puzzle. And then... Um, the, the last thing is, is, you know, we always talk about how um, teaching is sort of the loneliest profession in the world, but um, actually it's not. <laughs> An administrator is actually <laughs> Connie, like where, where does Connie go and how does she have that support? And, you know, if, if she can stop the upset parent or whatever it is at her door, then it doesn't come to us and it doesn't affect our students. And so, um, so just kind of hearing the support that they have and then how the systems and connections work within the districts was, um, and, and still is something that um, I've been able to learn from this. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. yeah, so uh, last year I completed the LEAP program through Santa Clara County, which means you go through a year of classes with, with, a, with a cohort and you receive your preliminary admin credential. And what I loved about that was getting to talk to other educators on a regular basis about their experiences at their school sites. Mm -hmm. We got to hear from principals. We got to hear from superintendents. We got a peek behind the curtain at what leadership and education looks like. And when that ended last year, while I was relieved to have finished that program and all the work that it entailed, I didn't really know what was what was to come next. Um, and this group, this group has been like the perfect next step for that. Um, being able to talk to other educators in our district, being able to hear from our principals, being able to hear from folks at the district office um, has been a really wonderful and informative experience for me as I'm just trying to soak up as much as I can to learn about what it means to be a leader in education. Um, and so I really appreciated this group for that and, and for giving that opportunity. Um, I wish we could meet a little bit more. Um, but, you know, going a few months between meetings can be hard. Um, but when we do meet, everyone is so excited to be there. They were they all opted into this. No one was forced to attend. And so the energy in the room and the excitement uh, is something that I always look forward to. Um, also, one thing as a you know as a as a teacher in this district, I know my my blocks my block colleagues so well. Um, we work together. We collaborate at professional development days. We often work together as well there. But I never have the opportunity, or rarely have the opportunity, to meet with uh, colleagues from Egan uh, and especially colleagues from the elementary schools. And so being able to make those uh, connections uh, and build those relationships and hear about what they're doing, even in kindergarten classrooms, in a weird way, gives me ideas for what to do in my eighth grade English classroom. So I'm just really grateful that we have the chance to actually work with the other amazing teachers in this district um, and just share our passion for teaching and like share our ideas for, you know, what we see as our next steps as well. So. Yeah, this is a, it's just a great group to be a part of. Great. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, 
why did I, you know, decide to join the aspiring leaders? Well, as Connie mentioned, she did give me that little tap on the shoulder. <laughs> but, um, you know, from, from my perspective, I, I'm only in my third year of teaching. I say that it gets like ever. <laughs> and so I feel like I still have a, a lot to learn. And, and especially um, going from last year to, to this year where I'm teaching three different things I, and, and I'm teaching AVID. I think in order to teach AVID is important to have, uh, you know, be a good leader and, and, and a mentor to, to students, mm -hmm. especially students that are, you know, um, that are in that class. So I, I jumped up the chance to, to to get to know more about how this district runs and, and all of the supports we have and all these different strategies. So that was really the, the why I was interested. And then, I mean, I know Connie brought up all of these people she looks up to, but she's someone that I look up to. So to have that uh, support and to, to be identified specifically, like, hey, you should, you know, you should think about doing this. And I was like, yes, yeah, that's for sure. That's what I want to do. And um, some things that I really enjoyed so far that I've learned about is hearing from all of the principals. I thought that was really fascinating because I, I mean, I didn't really know what goes on on the day to day and hearing how each of their days is kind of different, especially though they have the same job, they have different strategies that they implement and different systems that work at the different school sites. And I was like, you know, there really is no one perfect way to do something all of these different ways work and i was like that's really fascinating because sometimes i i, I compare myself to others and you know we're all different people so it's it's good to hear all of these different ways to uh, implement systems something that was really impactful to me was that first session because it's true none of us i think anticipated how overtly like emotional and, and raw it would be but it, it was a beautiful thing like you, you really had to be there to experience the emotion in the room and it, it wasn't something solid it was something that we all kind of came together to feel um i just felt a lot closer to people that i you know had only met one one or two times before and the people that i did know more i felt you know really connected to them and it made me want to go over and over and over again. So that's something that I really enjoy. The other thing I really liked was the, the DL on the DO. I thought that was really cool. Um, it was also funny because they were all wearing like the same color unintentionally. And I was like, you guys are really on the same wavelength. Like, <laughs> and um, so just hearing how they came up with some of the ideas and 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 the birth of the wheel and, and where it the orig um, where it originated from and 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 their goals and hopes for for what it looks like uh, in in our district was was just amazing. It, it made me realize, you know, all of these things are working for a reason, and and it's beautiful to see the inner machinations of everything going on here at the district. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, well, that concludes our, our presentation, but we're happy to take any questions that we might have. And I just want to thank Connie and our participants for helping help with our presentation. And Connie and I are having a good time with it. Can you tell? Yeah, yeah. I just really enjoying it. So you may think that Sandra runs the district, but really it's the board. <laughs> <laughs> so you may want to interview us to tell you the wheels people. Yeah. Let's come up with some yeah. with the board. Some uh, yeah, love that. The what, what can we call it? Uh, never mind. Not boring. Not boring with the board. Who said that? Charcuterie board with the board. <laughs> Thank you. Great. Yeah. Any other questions? No, uh, I have one clarifying question. Actually, for the people at home, and I know the answer, but uh, what is AVID? Oh, oh. oh. AVID is, um, it stands for Advancement via Individual Determination, which is a which is a class that um, is usually for students who come from lower socioeconomic backgrounds, underrepresented folks in um, higher education. So um, a lot of my students are, are Latino or are going to be first generation college students. And the, it's, it's a college prep course. It teaches them college and career readiness. So it teaches them organizational skills, life skills. And I think it's an amazing class. Can I give it a plug? Go ahead. Uh, last year at Egan, we had three students apply at Los Altos to be an AVID and they got in. This year we have uh, 11. Wow. So we uh, nearly tripled our our uh, our acceptance to AVID this year. And so, yeah. so kudos to Jen for yeah. uh, making that happen. Right and we had actually one little other letter. We had a TDSBC. What is the that? SDC. Oh, okay. um, yeah. yes, therapeutic special day class. Oh, thank yeah. you. <laughs> thank you. Okay.
that's it. Yeah, that was any, it. any public comment requests on this edit? Okay. okay. Any further comment from the board? Thank you. 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 Moving on to I2 LAC student experience, supporting environments for the safety and belonging. Back to Bosco again. Thank you so much. Uh, so I'm joined by the evening by Principal Zvenator and Principal Colomore. Um, I'm sorry, I forgot to say, if anyone would like to submit public comment on this item, please make sure you submit a speaker through. I'm uh, here to present a March update. We had Sarah Gerlinger here in January provide an update to the board on our work in this area. And so um, I'm here doing a March update. And again, this is around environments filled with safety and belonging. And this timeline of our collective work is the same slide that you saw in January with the addition of the TK6 identity uh, diversity justice um, read aloud and the student workshop at grade seven and eight. Uh, just as a reminder, we have adopted the framework, the social justice standards. Um, again, identity, diversity, justice, and action. What makes me, me, who am I? How are we alike and different? How do we affect each other? And how can we help each other? And there's standards for every grade level in each of these domains. Um, Sarah spoke about us getting ready to roll out the TK through sixth grade um, identity justice and diversity read alouds. And so these are some examples of uh, anchor charts, some vocabulary walls, a kinder inquiry, as well as a, a third grade discussion about identity. I've brought some samples from second grade and fifth grade and just set those up um, over in the side of the room. Um, but these have been happening in classrooms at the different grade levels, TK through six. Um, and seven and eight, I have Connie and Wade who are going to be talking a little bit about our work for the last few months there. I think it's pretty cool. You wore green. I forgot to type for blue pants. You wore green shirts. We're very color coordinated today. Uh, I, I think uh, one of the things that was really important to, to me as a principal is that before we started uh, some of our work is to do a student climate survey to see where students were um, and how they were feeling about being at school. Um, as I'm sure most of you know, and, and feel free to audience as well, as we want kids to come to school and feel safe, happy, and comfortable one that, while they're there. Uh, I think the first three items speak to that, and I think that the majority of our students feel like um, they do feel safe, happy, and comfortable while they're at school. And there were two areas that stuck out to me and I think to Wade as well, um, and to the folks that were looking at the data from kids. Um, and that is that 58% uh, of our students think it's really okay to, to use uh, jokes about racial identity or things like that. Um, to, and, that and then that's perfectly fine. Uh, and also I think you'll notice on the last one that 50, 55 student percent of our students um, can be emotionally affected by the gossip and things that occur around um, rumors or drama that is made for them. Uh, those are two areas that I know are a huge concern to, to Wade and I. And so as we were planning uh, with the district office for how we would sort of approach that with some of the incidents that had occurred at school, some that have been well publicized and some that haven't has been well publicized, to be quite honest is that how do we make sure that kids understand how uh, to interact with their peers and to make sure that we're creating an environment that is safe for all kids and staff and uh, everybody here at school. Um, overwhelming to me as we as we did some of the, the work this last week in, um, in the anti-bias trainings is that kids really do believe that sometimes things that they say among their friend groups and things that they say to each other are funny or getting a laugh at the expense of others is something that um, can be entertaining to them. And I think that is something where I'm choosing with my staff to really push our work forward. And how do we help kids understand that what they say, what while they might think it's funny within their, their friend group or within their, their uh, group of students is uh, can be very damaging and um, more than inappropriate. I would just add that um, <clears throat> Egan and Block's data was remarkably similar, um, remarkably similar, so not, not surprising. Um, but the other thing that I would 
that spoke to me in the survey is that students are experiencing all kinds of aggressions. Uh, it's not just anti-Semitism. It's not just Islamophobia. There's racism. There's homophobia. There's ableism. And uh, those were mentioned throughout both of our surveys. Can I ask one quick clarifying yeah. question? When was the survey taken? Um, the survey February. February. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, a couple of weeks before uh, we did the anti-bias training. Thank you. Yeah. We wanted to be uh, sure we were addressing uh, things in the moment. Thank you. Uh, I, I think the first three, like, speak well, right? I think my oh. kids, for the for majority of them are feeling safe and supported. Okay, so I'm going to talk about um, the training that took place uh, last week at both Egan and Block. Um, this was done by the ADL, um, and just some highlights to it, um, and start off by saying that it hit its mark in that we were able to get kids to, uh, understand that certain topics are very sensitive and how we go about that and how we speak to each other is very important. Also common vocabulary intent versus impact, uh, no matter what your intent, but we want to get kids to understand their words, their actions have impact, sometimes deep, deep impact. Um, so prior to the sessions, we discussed, we said we're doing this because we've had some incidents here. Uh, as Connie said, some were public, some we said you may not know about. Um, and our goal is to create a more inclusive environment for our school. Um, and so there were a number of activities that the students did. Um, including grouping and understanding groups and dynamics of group that sometimes there's an in-group and an out-group, um, and then some strategies and some skill building in what to do uh, if you yourself are suffering aggressions or if you witness it. So uh, talking about allyship and what is an ally. Um, the, up there, the six, six easy strategies of assuming good intent and explaining impact. I, I heard you say that I, I, you probably didn't mean it that way, but you know, did you know that that's that's how this person feels if you were if you were a witness to it or a bystander, or even if you're the um, target of something? Saying I, you probably didn't mean it that way, but this is how it made me feel. Um, asking a question: Well, what do you mean by that? Do you mean um, all people are like that? Um, fill in the blank. Uh, interrupt and redirect, like. Hey, we're not going to do that here. That's not what we're about. But hey, did you see uh, the latest? Did you see the latest uh, movie last week or something? So that you can change the topic, and then broaden it to universal behavior. In other words, breaking down stereotypes um, and saying, you know, does that apply for everybody? Um, and kind of giving kids those tools, and then um, make it individual. Is that something you believe, or is that something that your friends believe? Or is that just you? Um, and then the one, ouch, where it's quick in the moment, ouch, that hurts. And then allowing the student to say, oops, that wasn't my intention. Um, got some feedback from um, some students actually today. Um, and moving forward, I think what we want to do is make sure that uh, our trainings moving forward are more frequent, uh, perhaps less in duration, <laughs> some feedback I got. Um, and also, more to the issues that our students are, they themselves suffering and going over the harm and the hurt that they personally experience um, in, in, different, in different situations. Um, and so I think it did a good job of opening the ground for fertility of, of these sensitive discussions. Um, and I think students are at least more aware of what they're saying or at least more aware of, hey, this is something that we as a community, we don't stand for that stuff. So, um, so moving forward at the TK through sixth grade, we're going to continue to expand those book sets um, for the grade levels and add additional resources and then seek feedback from our teachers and classrooms. And then at the seventh and the eighth grade level, um, we'll develop some um, follow-up student activities, either through advisory or health classes. Again, going to those specific personal experiences that students um, mentioned in those surveys. 
And then uh, taking a look at both Viking and Falcon Camp and really kicking the year off with some of these skills that um, kids were taught, but like, you know, our staff can certainly um, branch that out into the skills so that we're starting the school year off with even uh, a better climate than what, as hard as we work to get our climate to be. Um, and then do you wanna to speak to staff? Um, so we've been uh, consulting with a variety of community organizations throughout um, the last several months. And so we intend to continue to consult and just get advice from the different organizations and different partners um, so that we can continue our professional learning for our teachers, our administrators, our staff, and also plan appropriate lessons for our students. And then there, there's a lot of um, feelings around these topics. And so creating opportunities for feedback um, from our staff, from our students, and from our parents is, is important as we move forward. Um, so that concludes our update uh, for this area of the wheel this evening, but we're happy to take any questions that you might have. For our final questions? We have, I believe we have some public comment from this panel, so we'll take I think I want to make sure that folks know um, how important it is that all kids feel safe at our junior high schools. Uh, it's a really interesting time of life for those of us that have already had it <laughs> uh, and those that are in the middle of going through it. It can be a very tumultuous time. And it's it's uh, an area that I think uh, Wade and I do do have some experience in, and, and I, I feel grateful for that to be partnering with Wade as we try to navigate this, this time with kids. Um, kids don't always say the right things. Um, they say things that are hurtful, that are unkind. Sometimes they are intentional. Sometimes they are um, not intentional. Um, sometimes they lack information and knowledge. And I just, I wanna make sure that as a, as we try to navigate these difficult situations that we're doing that thoughtfully, there are times when kids receive consequences that others may or may not know about. There was always conversations with families. Uh, there was always additional learning that happens. And I just, I just want to make sure the board knows that, um, that it's, it's difficult and it's, it's unfortunate and it, uh, it impacts uh, the entire school community. And um, I hope to, that going forward, we can help our kiddos figure this out and minimize those. I think the idea of having those conversations happen at that Viking and Falcon camp, I don't know if you guys know what that is, but the first few days of school, both Egan and Block have three days devoted to sort of uh, acclimating to the, the intermediate schools or the junior high schools. Uh, they're only with us for two years. And uh, I think adding that to our curriculum for that time um, and really hitting that directly and hard will be really helpful as we move forward in trying to create safe spaces for kids. Um, because at the end of the day, that is 100% the most important thing for our kiddos. Thank you. I just wanna take a moment and thank um, Connie and Wade. Uh, we all attended every single session. Um, that was about 27 sessions uh, with students because we wanted them in small groups. We didn't want assembly style. And so we sat in all of the sessions. And so that really um, was a big commitment for them. And, and want to thank them for navigating these times and being here this evening. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. So we'll take public comment and then we'll come back for board discussion. Sounds good. What you do? <laughs> okay. Um, we have five speakers. Um, and so we will do three minutes each. We will start with Ellie Katz, followed by Vadim Katz, followed by Tal Arwatz. I apologize as always for any mispronunciation of the name. Um, my name is Ellie Katz, and I'm an eighth grader at Block Middle School. I've been part of the Los Altos School District for nine years, and today I'm so disappointed in my school. <clears throat> On December 15th, swastikas were found at Block, and as a Jewish student, I had high hopes that they would be addressed properly. They weren't. I recently had the ADL lesson, which was supposedly a solution to the anti-Semitic acts, and yet I didn't even hear the word anti-Semitism defined once. Instead, I learned that next time I get called a dirty Jew, I should just say ouch. The ADL lesson I received was about bullying and explained that bullying was not acceptable. It had nothing to do with anti-Semitism. And instead of feeling heard by the school, I feel unsupported. Bullying is not okay. Body shaming is not okay. But we found anti-Semitism at block. I choose to wear the Star of David, 
And yet now I question whether I should take it off because if my school is will, because if someone in my school is willing to call for the murder of Jews and the district doesn't have my back, I am not safe. In 1939, the Nazi party of Germany was drawing swastikas and calling for the murder of Jews. And as a result, six million people of my ethnicity were murdered in cold blood, including some of my family. By not addressing the anti-Semitism for what it is, you are being a bystander. By generalizing the swastikas as just hate, you are refusing to educate my school on what really happened. Block Intermediate School made the news, and I am ashamed of it. I am ashamed that the hate crimes found there drew the attention of countless people, and yet you still choose to disregard it. By turning a blind eye, you let it pass. I am a 14-year-old girl. I deserve to feel supported and protected by my school. Instead, I feel ignored and targeted. I am so incredibly disappointed at how things have been handled since the swastikas were found. This is an act of anti-Semitism. Call it what it is. You have been given a platform of power. Use it to educate the students in our district how to recognize harassment towards Jewish students like myself. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Redeem Katz, followed by Tal Arwatz, followed by Tal Shalom. I'm Redeem Katz. How can we teach bigotry and harassment without teaching how to identify it? Even after years of general anti-bias and anti-harassment trainings, many people are not aware when their words are hurtful to Jewish people and cause insecurity for our children. Next year, my daughter will enter high school. She and her peers will immediately be exposed to ethnic studies, which depending on the teacher and curriculum may showcase Jews as oppressors and colonizers. High school kids are more judgmental and aggressive. How do you propose my 14-year-old daughter rely on the ouch she learned from ATL training last week when she experiences hurtful ignorance? What should have been taught to all children is that anti-Semitism is delegitimization, demonization, or double standard directed towards people who identify as Jewish. When someone draws swastika on a Jewish student's locker or does a Hail Hitler salute, they imply to those students that they have no right to exist. We can explain Holocaust as a, gen a genocide of Jewish people by Nazi Germany using the swastika as a symbol. When someone calls a student a dirty Jew, they repeat the trope of from the 14th century when Jews were blamed for spreading black, uh, black uh, plague. We can use this to teach kids how ignorance leads to demonization of a minority perceived as well-to-do. When someone says Jews are committing genocide, we can explore what this means, discuss past historical instances so we can teach kids critical thinking to empower them how to check if such claim is real double standard. Our kids are exposed to TikTok where they hear things far worse. LASD took a proactive step, but the superintendent's office failed to deliver along with ADL. I know DEI teacher training is happening next. According to DEI, Jews are grouped together as privileged white people and thus denied recognition of systemic harassment. At the same time, 30% of all hate crime in San Francisco last year was directed toward Jewish community, according to Mayor Breed, when she spoke yesterday at the Unity March, which I attended, which is a 250% increase from 2022. How much longer can we wait until this board finds the strength and responsibility to work together for the benefit of raising all of our children, not just Jewish children, clear of this profound ignorance? Thank you. Thank you. Tyler Watts, followed by Tal Shalom, followed by Sagan Rosenberg. Good evening to the school board. My, my name is Tal R. Watts, and I'm a Jewish eighth grader at Block Middle School. I'm here to talk about the ADL curriculum and recent anti-Semitic events on our campus. Although we appreciate the effort, the program was not effective, and it had no correlation or mention to Jewish hate, as we were assured it would. Recent swastika incidents on our campus have left us, left us feeling deeply unsafe. We were assured several times that there would be multiple lessons addressing anti-Semitism. However, it was like nothing had ever happened. We feared we would be harmed. We felt unsafe in our daily life. We were disappointed and concerned that the lesson failed to address the severity of the incident and was not age appropriate. Are we expected to say ouch next time someone does the Hitler salute towards us? The lack of recognition has left us fearful in our own community. As students, we expect to feel safe and supported in our community, and we expect lessons addressing these recent events without sugarcoating, just facts, 
because these events are very thank you. Good evening. Um, I wanted to address what we saw uh, in the presentation when 25%, I think, kids don't feel safe, which is a little bit worrisome. And I asked the board to check it, just something that I saw now that they don't feel safe about the religion, race, or ethnicity. But I wrote. <laughs> I also want to share what my son told me about the training. It had nothing to do with anti-Semitism, no explanation, not mentioning the Holocaust. It didn't feel it, it addresses the current issues of modern anti-Semitism. Yesterday, 10,000 people walked in San Francisco against anti-Semitism. The incident that occurred in a school were anti-Semitic. The rise of anti-Semitism in our community and its calls for a specific intervention. And we've been asking it for a long time, for months, and I don't understand why nothing is being done. It's hard to see when you are biased, but just think what the board would have done if there was an incident against black student. And we know you have done more. And what we are doing is not enough. Our, if our teacher and our student will, learn, will not learn about the uniqueness and the modern form of anti-Semitism, we will see escalation. Anti-Semitism has been around for thousands of years. It's the denial of the truth and the promoting of lies. There are so many lies that are being promoted and they need to be addressed. The school missed its opportunity to educate our kids about the root and dangers of anti-Semitism. And it's very disappointing. We are worried that the teacher training will look the same. And we ask the board, the board to form a task committee to include parents from the community to help fight anti-Semitism. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Rosenberg. My name is Yvonne Rosenberg, and I'm an eighth grader at Walk. Last week, we had a program that was supposed to teach us about anti-Semitism. While it did teach us about hate and bullying, it mentioned nothing about anti-Semitism. I was very disappointed, as my expectations once again deceived me. I was a star of David around my neck. However, three months ago, swastikas were found in my school, making me question whether or not I should take it off. I even had one of my friends come up to me and tell me, I don't think you're safe here anymore. I expected things to be done about it immediately, and while they were, two weeks later, after we had returned from winter break, it was as if nothing had happened. I expect to come to school as feeling safe, but unfortunately, that is rarely the case anymore. Knowing that there are uneducated people, those willing to call for the genocide of Jews at my school, makes me lose hope for my generation. My classmates and I should not be learning oops and ouch, but should be learning about anti-Semitism, an issue that has been rising for 3,500 years. It is 2024, put a stop to this ignorance and face the rising problems in Thank you. Then, I believe in the last public speaker, so we will um, resume for discussion. Um, we, uh, it's easier to talk here or up there, but does anyone have comments or further questions, discussion? <clears throat> If not, I have one. Um, so first of all, I, I was under the impression that there was going to be discussion of um, sort of the anti-Semitic incidents that happened on campus as part of this training. So I don't know if you can sort of comment to that assertion. So I I started every session reminding students that we did have that incident, as well as other incidents, including racism and Islamophobia and referencing the student survey that that students actually called that out as well. Yes, yeah, similarly, um, I began every session with uh, talking about uh, recent incidences of uh, anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, as well, Islamophobia. Uh, we, I had also had some instances of racism as well. Um, and so I addressed all of those directly. Um, Again, keeping the, the confidentiality of students uh, as per. But I did I we I did mention uh, that we had incidences prior to the December break. Um, it does seem, given what's going on in the world um, and some of the incidents that 
I've personally heard about in other districts and other campuses that are, you know, all, all, everything up in, to including assaults, unfortunately, not in our schools, but in schools nearby. It does feel a little bit discordant to me that sort of the framing is still sort of heavy on jokes and comments, as opposed to, unfortunately, there are people in our community who mean some of these things. And so I do sort of wonder what are we communicating in terms of, you know, I think what I hear from some of our public speak, public commenters is this sort of worry that somebody will do something on purpose to hurt or intimidate them. <laughs> and it will be addressed through the lens of they were joking, they didn't mean it, or maybe they didn't mean it, or maybe they just don't understand what they were saying. And so I wonder if there's, I would, I would love to get your perspective on that and sort of wonder, you know, how, if somebody does do this on purpose, what does that look like? We, we, I think we speak to this. We um, talked about the um, seriousness of an impact of harm that these incidents can have all the way up to students contemplating suicide. And uh, the presenters walked us through, there's a difference um, between uh, snitching and reporting. And so we talked about snitching as you're trying purposely to get someone in trouble, reporting is when you're trying to seek support and help and assistance. So we absolutely did cover incidents that are serious of nature. Um, the strategies around the joking and harmful incidents were directly correlated to that particular survey question, but we absolutely did get into the more serious incidents of harm and prejudice and bias and how do you report those and seek support and help to that and how um, do you feel safe to report? Because there's a, a sensitivity around the junior high kids about reporting and being um, called a snitch. And so we did address that specifically in that 90 minute session. And is that something that's sort of communicated to teachers as well to make sure that they're not just going to be boys will be boys? Absolutely. Yeah. Yes, yeah, sure. Um, two things. One is back to this common language. Um, you're teaching it to the students. We want to make sure that you're teaching it to the, to the teachers, but not just the teachers, but the staff. I would like to see common language from our maintenance staff all the way up to our superintendent and the board actually. I think we should all be speaking the same language. Um, when you were telling me about the oops and ouch, is does that language come from the ADL curriculum? Because that seems a little juvenile for our seventh and eighth graders. Um, I think our kids are incredibly smart and mature. And I, I could just explain this oops and ouch thing because I don't think that, okay, I have been the subject of racist attacks and oops and ouch would not have done a damn thing. So can you please ex explain this oops and ouch? That's all I'm saying. You know, I think oops and ouch is more of a lower level aggression. It certainly does not work for something more extreme. Um, and so a lot of the training focused on what can you as a bystander, if you see that, step in and ally. Um, I think there's more work to do with kids on how do they self-advocate at an appropriate level, given what the aggression is. But yeah, I agree. And, I, and that was said to me this, this afternoon by some very astute students. Like, I'm not going to, that doesn't, I'm not going to say ouch if I'm called a dirty Jew. Absolutely not. You shouldn't. That, that, that's that's not an appropriate response. So, are are we teaching kids what a response? If someone says something like this awful thing, right? What? How do they respond in the moment? And then what is the follow up? Are we teaching kids that? So, so I think um, I don't know. Can we go back and slide to the six? Uh, so I think saying ouch or oops, right? I think I feel like that's a microaggression conversation, right? Or a response. Uh, I think when we're looking at something like that, uh, like Mr. K, yeah. I have also uh, been the victim of uh, attacks. This is going to be my 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 day uh, of some LGBTQIA attacks uh, within this district from students as uh, and in and then in my own life, and I think teaching students that we need to interrupt and redirect 
is a more appropriate response for something that egregious. I think there is a time and a place for ouch. If I'm in a classroom uh, as a former teacher and I'm teaching and someone uh, says something, you know, that is, uh, is inappropriate, but not, uh, as demeaning as something the kids just refer to, then I'm like, oh, ouch, that's not okay. Like you, we need to to revisit that. But I think in the case of something that is that egregious and is that hateful and is that inappropriate, I think that is where we need to interrupt as kids, as adults, and as families, and that is not okay. And then that is the time when kids need to report. Um, I have a great deal of respect for the, the students at my school. That is exactly what they did. Um, that incident that happened with us in, in November was uh, horrendous and inappropriate and needs to never happen again on our campus. Those children had the, uh, the wherewithal to interrupt and report. We need to teach our kids to interrupt and to report if it's that egregious. There is a place for ouch and there's a place for interrupting and redirecting and reporting. Um, and I and I don't want to I do not want to minimize what these kids have gone through because what they're talking about is not an out situation. What they're talking about is an interrupt and a redirect and um, make sure that you're reporting and that you get the support that you need. Thank you so much for explaining the oops and ouch language. I appreciate that. You know, kids say kids say really dumb things a lot. Um, yeah. And and I think. Oh, my gosh, as I'm looking around, each and every one of you has had uh, either a kid at my school or a block. And there's a time for an ouch, and there is a time for a redirect and uh, an interruption, and to to make it a more individual situation. And so, I would not advocate in the situations that these kiddos have run into, or the kid situations that have happened at our, both of our schools this year, that we respond uh, to that with an ouch. That does not feel like an ouch. That feels like an uh, interrupt, a redirect, and an, uh, and consequences need to be delivered, and education needs to happen. Meetings with parents need to happen. Uh, we can't always, because of uh, confidentiality, we can't always say what those consequences are. Uh, but but I need I need the board to know and I need families to know there have been at Egan and at Block some significant consequences that you may not be aware of uh, because Sarah, because safety is paramount for these kids. I'm really glad that we're doing this now because this has such a profound impact on children. In sixth grade, someone told me that I should be killed because I'm Indian. And see, even now to recount that makes me feel very emotional. And for many years, even at this age, I kind of walk around with my head ducked a little bit just to be careful. Don't want to stand out. Don't want to draw attention. It's because these things happen at such a young, impressionable age. Um, I'm just wondering, you know, maybe you can speak to the ADL folks who are doing this, but I think we need to go a little bit further and a little I don't want to I hate this term to go there like you know what I mean <laughs> feel like it's overused but I kind of feel like we need to go there right yeah I think one of the things Wade said earlier was it sort of uh opened the door and sort of mm -hmm. set the foundation um I, I don't disagree with you I think we need to go there mm -hmm. um uh Miss Sikani who many of you know who yeah. taught health for many many years at Egan uh and I were having a conversation after our trainings on um, Monday and Tuesday. Going there re requires a relationship. Mm -hmm. Going there requires a relationship. And I think our first step was ADL. Uh, I think it's laid the groundwork, but I don't think it's the end. Mm -hmm. I think there has to be more conversation. Uh, but I think that requires a relationship of Wade. It requires my relationship with kids. It requires the teacher's relationship with kids. And as we move forward, it has to be a broader conversation. It has to include the board. It has to include the district office. It has to include all of us and our personal experiences to make sure that kids are safe. Um, and I, I, but I do, I, I think it was a good first step. I know that uh, using the ADO was, uh, came with uh, some issues on all the sides, but I do think, uh, if we could look at it from a positive lens, I do think it opened the conversation for us to be able to have more of those with kids, especially with our seventh graders. Um, and eighth graders, I know you're leaving us in three months, but I think it gives us an opportunity for the next three months to have some of those more difficult conversations that um, maybe we haven't been able to have before. And that's me on my soapbox, sorry. I appreciate that, I do. And like the sixth grader that's still stuck in here appreciates that, so thank you so much. Yeah. Going a slightly different direction. Some things I've heard was um, 
the lack of education about history almost. And my question was, are we looking at keeping up the history that we do teach to include a more specific sort of conversation about what, what went on? Because I don't remember having that conversation when I was in that level of school, not later. I didn't get it when I was young. And so is there a way to look at the curriculum that we're doing too in, in parallel? I think this, to your point, great first, good first step, not great, but good first step, build on it. Sounds like the plan. But then maybe tech, looking back at the curriculum side of it. So a way to make sure that people are understanding history from everyone's point of view. Yeah, that's a good point. That context is super important. Because because then, then it becomes easier for kids to identify what's and hopefully for children to feel safer if people are being told what was wrong or done. Is that a way to address that? Something just to think about. Yeah. And then the curriculum council if we're going back through. So we look at that there. Have that conversation. Just a thought. Thank you. Is there, I wonder if, because I'm not sort of clear in my own mind, whether um, there's sort of a set policy on how complaints like this are handled. And I, I wonder if that would, if it's possible and if it would help if sort of all the students on campus were sort of clear that like, you know, if you step over the line from ouch to, you know, paid crime, mm -hmm. here's what you can expect to happen either to the person that you did it to you or to you if you decide to do that. So. That's a, um, a, a perfect suggestion for our advisory health. What is a, what does constitute that in terms of student conduct and behavior and what are the consequences of failure with it with the complaint process? Yes, that makes a lot of sense. Right, because I know like I, I, some of the terrible stories that I've heard from around the state, there have been students that have been the target of hateful, intentional behavior who haven't even been able to get that kid out of their classroom. Mm -hmm. And so I worry that some of our students are reluctant to report things because if they're still gonna have to sit next to this kid for another five months, that's just gonna be worse. So I, I hope that A, our policy would be if we determine a verbal assault that we get removed from the classroom at a minimum. But it'd be good, I think, if we could establish that policy if we don't have it already and then uh, promulgate it so that everybody's clear. Because I think I can imagine as a student, you know, you sort of you don't really know what's gonna happen, what's gonna happen next. Am I gonna end up being in a worse situation? So uh, I can only speak to it from from my own experience of having been again for a long time. That's standing operate standard operating procedure for us. There's something like that, then uh, schedule changes are uh, if if that's something that's desired by the, the the family, then that is always something that happens at a, at a minimum. Um, often more than that, but at a minimum, uh, that always happens. That's always been my impression as well, but I don't know if everybody knows that. Mm -hmm. so. Fair. Yeah. And I thank the public comment speakers tonight for having the courage to come and speak their truth. Mm -hmm. you know, it's, yeah, really. I don't know that I could have said it. Couldn't have done that when I was in eighth grade, I'm real sure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you again to everybody. We'll move on to I3 Penn site update. We gotta go. Oh, do we need a break? Okay. That was a very emotional topic. Let's take a five minute break. Thank you. We are here tonight uh, for a somewhat quick site update. Um, 
talk a little bit about uh, what was discussed at our last meeting. You asked for some staff work to be done, so we'll go over that. Um, and then in our next item, I believe we uh, will have a, a discussion debrief and then talk about some next steps for the group. So just as a reminder in this ongoing conversation around the temp site, around the placement for Bullis Charter School, all of these pieces are together. Um, that the staff has done a lot of things in the last year from a new demographic study. We're deep into our facilities master planning. We're working on some financial planning. Um, I think I sent you all a, a save the date for a study session before our next meeting to have um, more of a financial study session, which will be great. Um, our CEQA, we are in process of the environmental review for the tent site. Um, I think in the next week or two, we're going to be going out for the um, request for a proposal for a design build for the tent site. Um, we know that the county board has put the charter school on notice around their demographics. Um, we've talked for many years as part of this, I actually went back to the, to the multiple studies around the middle school model and what would be best, best for our sixth grade students. So we know that that's been a, a conversation as a preferred option, but that we've had challenges being able to implement that option. Of course, TK expansion um, and uh, enrollment um, declining and now steadying. Um, and in all of that, your guiding principles around how you wanna make decisions for the tent site really hasn't changed. Um, at our last meeting, you all looked back at the, I can't remember, Jessica, I always go to you, the 53 numbers pulled down to the 13 options, um, but really we spent some time, you spent some time talking through these six options. Um, if I can summarize what I think I heard, nobody really enjoyed option four, five, or six, all of which included having to close a school, um, nobody really liked option three, and um, most folks preferred option one with some, maybe option two could work. That's my, <laughs> my easy, simple summary of um, last discussion. And then there was really a, uh, a question around um, how is the sharing of our junior high schools impacting our ability to move to a middle school model? Is it something we could do? In the meantime, um, what does that impact actually look like in real? So we um, we spent some time, I spent some time since our last meeting going in. So this might be more detailed than you were looking for, but I really think it's important because a lot of these um, agreements for sharing have been in place now for quite some time. And for me, I was like, oh yeah, I forgot about that piece. Oh yeah, I forgot about that piece. So I'm going to do kind of an overview of what the current sharing arrangement looks like. So if you look specifically at Egan, this is the aerial map of Egan, and everything within the purple block is exclusive use for Bullis Charter School on the Egan campus. So, um, and thank you to Connie. I know that Connie and Wade have left, but Connie and Dina were helpful in reminding me because I had forgotten about some recent changes. But so they have exclusive use for, of course, their campus area, which is on the right. They call this their North Campus. Um, they have, as part of that, exclusive parking. And then most recently, how do I press the little button? Um, the tennis courts at Egan were taken over and many additional portables were were placed onto that. And this is a kind of a newer expansion of their campus for exclusive, exclusive use. And I think this is a shade canopy for some lunchtime. And then Connie and Dina reminded me that they also have permanent use of two basketball courts on the blacktop. So Egan students never have access to those courts. Um, currently we have five, uh, 497, 500 Egan LASD students. Um, 
And per our agreement, although we don't know the exact numbers of who actually shows up uh, for Bullish Charter School to learn there every day, they can have a max of 775 students on campus. Um, that's Egan. Then we move to Block, and Block is a little more complicated, <laughs> a little more spread out. So everything in this purple area is considered the exclusive use of Bullis Charter School, what they call their South Campus. Um, so that includes their kind of their main campus area is here. Um, they have their own parking area, and then they actually have this little um, one row of parking in the main campus that's for their exclusive use. And then in the past couple of years, that has expanded to two classrooms. So this used to be the French classroom at Block, and this used to be the health classroom at Block. And so both of those classrooms were given to Bullis Charter as exclusive use classrooms. I think one is their STEM lab now, this French classroom is their STEM lab. This could be a library, but I'm not sure exactly. So we have 406 students, so 400 students at Block, and they can have, per the agreement, no more than 500 students on that campus learning at one time. So that's the exclusive use sharing. If we move on beyond, it's more than just exclusive use. There's also a shared facilities component. Um, so at Block, uh, or I'll start on the left, at Egan, and the, it's similar to Block. Um, Bullis Charter School has 20 days of exclusive use of the multi, um, and that's during the day for their whatever activities they may use that could include PE, that could just include assemblies, events, um, but during the day, after school, and evening. And those are scheduled with our staff at the beginning of the school year. All of those things are calendared out. Um, and then at Egan, they have one dedicated allocated PE rotation. And I have a picture of that to come. But so each um, period of the day, they are allocated for a chunk of time. If you remember your PE time, you had units of instruction. You might be in a basketball skills unit or a fill in the blank unit. So um, at that time, they always have a rotation either of the multi, the gym, the blacktop, beyond their two basketball courts at Egan, but just the general blacktop, or the track and field. So at on any one day, one period per day is scheduled for exclusive use for um, the charter school. Um, over at Block, there's a little bit more from that. So they have those two things. Um, and then over there, they also have access to the softball and tennis courts. Um, as one of those PE rotation spaces. But in addition to that, um, the agreement calls for outdoor PE space or just outdoor space that could include the blacktop, it could include the field, depending on what sport season it is. But they have access from after school until 4.30 every day. And then um, if you've been to the drama or the little theater, it used to be called the drama chorus room. Monday, Wednesday, Friday, each week they have access or exclusive access to that from 7 to 8 a.m. and 3 to 5 p.m., three days a week to help run their programs. So that's kind of what the sharing of facilities looks like. This is, from all intents and purposes, nicely calendared um, between, but poses a challenge of always having to share these spaces and kind of losing some flexibility. So as I chatted with our folks, really wanting to understand what are the impacts to kids, to programs, to the neighborhood um, on sharing one campus, Block or Egan, with two full schools. And so, of course, you've all heard it, and many of you have experienced it, um, neighborhood traffic, parking, walking and biking safety concerns for kids. We have somewhere between 900 to potentially 1,300 kids on either of the campuses at one time with an identical, I believe, or closely identical start and end time to the day. Um, so that's a, a concern and an impact for sure. 
there is certainly time spent on the sharing and I don't want to minimize people's time because our, our folks are doing lots of different things, but our teachers, our PE teachers are working closely with their staff, um, our site administrators, our district staff are working closely to co coordinate all this and to troubleshoot challenges that come up and there are challenges that come up every year. Um, it has a great impact on our ability to be flexible for our PE units. Um, they are taking that dedicated space each and every day. And I think I have a slide for that. Um, so we lose some flexibility for our PE program for kids. Of course, we have um, given up the tennis courts at Egan um, for that newer extension of the BCS North campus. So that means our after school tennis program from what I heard from Connie that either happens at the high school or even up at Foothill College that kids participating in after school tennis have to go to one of those spaces depending on who's coaching and the availability of those courts. So our Egan kids don't quite have that same access that our black students may. Um, you know, sharing the multi for those 20 days over the course of the year just provides a little less flexibility than I think everybody would prefer. Um, same with the drama chorus room at Block, um, you know, designing a program, whether it's a drama production or something, but knowing that other people are gonna come into your space morning and afternoon, <clears throat> it's just, you know, it's a more, more of a challenge. Um, there are certainly, oops, supervision challenges. Um, this is, I heard this more so from Egan than I did from Block, but, um, you know, our kids are, are maybe going to their newer campus on Egan and walking through PE that's happening on the field and the track at that time. And so sometimes there's just some interactions that may or may not be productive that staff then has to work through because our folks don't know the charter school kids and their folks don't know our kids. So it's, it's just some supervision challenges. And then ultimately um, these impacts really limit us from being able to move our sixth graders to middle school now while we're still sharing. And I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, so generally the overcrowding is intense. If we wanted to add, you know, two to 300 additional kids on each campus, we would be looking at pretty um, large numbers of kids that would be more traffic, that would be more um, safety concerns. Uh, adding to that, uh, we know through all the research we did, and I don't believe that research has changed that the ideal number of students for a, a real student-centered middle school is about 500 to 750 kids. And so when you include that with sharing other spaces and trying to work around that, um, that poses a challenge. I would say the most restrictive thing about being able to move forward, be, if we could get over the traffic and the safety concerns, would be um, the PE sharing. There is no space at Egan, so Dina shared with me what their um, space looks like. Kind of, this is actually a screenshot of the calendar that they share between the two groups. Um, this is just the first three weeks of school, so you can see that we have four PE classes running every period. Class one is using the track and field for their unit. Class two is in the gym, class three is in the multi, and the charter school at this time has the blacktop that switches all year, but there is no fifth space for us to add another rotation, um, which would be impossible if we wanted sixth graders to have daily PE, which I believe has always been a part of the want for the design to move to middle school. Um, it would also be a challenge for us if there was some building or upgrading of classrooms that we wanted to do in order to accommodate our sixth graders at our middle schools. 
we don't have, usually we would maybe plop down some portables on the blacktop and move people out and renovate some classrooms. We don't have that extra space in order to do that. Um, what does that mean for our sixth graders? And again, as long as I've been around here, we've been talking about this of what our sixth graders are not getting and what they get is fantastic, but it could be so much more. Um, this idea of spe specialized teachers, whether that is our elective teachers who have great expertise, our language teachers, our music teachers, could be a specialized math teacher. Um, the idea of having consistent instructional minutes, we've reported to the board many times how our sixth graders across the district, um, because of the nature of master schedules at an elementary school, are experiencing different numbers of minutes in different course subjects. Uh, it's not at all consistent across our district, and it's really, there is no way to make it very consistent across our district because of the nature of our um, individual school, elementary school schedules. Uh, they're not having the opportunity for daily physical education, um, specialized electives, whether that would be a choose your own elective or many sixth graders begin with exploratory wheels where they have many different opportunities. We've um, attempted in the past to add some of those electives to our elementary. Of course, they have access to music. Yeah, our sixth graders, we've added on our computer science system course to try to give them something beyond just their core curriculum, but they would have a much broader experience at our junior highs because you've all heard about the great elective offerings that we do offer our junior high school students. Um, Every other, I believe, um, school district in our county, the sixth graders participate in after school sports. It's a great opportunity for kids. We have many sixth graders who are doing um, club sports or rec sports, but they're missing out on that school team sport, which is really a, a missed opportunity for our sixth graders. Uh, we would love to be able to provide a more comprehensive health class for sixth graders. Yeah. Um, ranging all the great topics that um, that are seventh and eighth graders, but at a developmental developmentally appropriate level for sixth graders, um, a missed opportunity right now. And um, if you talk to any of our, I'd say five, six, fifth and sixth grade teachers and principals, uh, being able to have more developmentally appropriate social activities, and community building activities, opportunities for leadership, opportunities for clubs, all of those things are sixth graders. Again, we try to build some of these things to, to accommodate what's happening at elementary school, uh, but it would be much more rich at a, in a middle school model. Let's see. Uh, I don't know if it's helpful to answer these questions now related to this, or if we want to go on to our next item, Brian, and then kind of do a big discussion. But ultimately, I want to know what other information might be helpful for you as we get closer to um, making some decisions around the tech site. Okay, well, let's see if there's any questions and yep. comments around this presentation specifically. Um, any clarifying questions? Do we have public comment? All right. Um, we have one request for public comment, so it will be three minutes. Um, Jeff Drager. Thank you to the board. I uh, appreciate your work on this difficult uh, issue. And to show my appreciation, I'll be very brief. <laughs> I, uh, I, I continue to think that uh, Proximity to the community is a super important factor here in terms of the people who are going to the community schools. It's important for safety, for fairness, and for acceptance of the community. Um, since we're still wrestling with this, just kind of brainstorming over the last month, a couple of things that you can take or leave. Um, you know, we could look pretty easily at how many students are coming in on foot or bike to the community school versus the ones who are choosing to go to a charter school and see if there'd be more students affected having to travel across El Camino in the Egan scenario or whatever the other scenarios are. And to look at the safety impact of that with some real data, just having some simple, you know, tallying. Now, from the world of 
nothing's as simple as Jeff says. Like you'd have to carefully <laughs> design it and not tell everybody to bike to school or whatever that day. <laughs> and then have some kids get dropped off across the street. But it seems like there's maybe something there if, if we want to do it that would be not too expensive. <clears throat> and then uh, we at least have the <clears throat> addresses of the students in our schools. <clears throat> we calculate the proximity to the school and the effect on them, what percentage change they would have based on uh, uh, Superintendent McConnell's comments. Maybe we don't have the transparency to compare to the charter schools. It sounds like we may not but maybe we could estimate that, but we could see the impacts on, you know, how many kids are walking, biking versus being driven anyways, and that would affect the safety impact. And then just the inconvenience based on the addresses, you could get a pretty good estimate. So, so anyways, I don't want to give you more work, but uh, continue to believe that the community really like deserves to be close to their school if they've chosen to go to those schools. And those might be some extra data points to look at. So thank you. Thank you. Extra minute left over. <laughs> <laughs> um, any follow up comment and questions on sort of this around <clears throat> the sharing specifically? Anything that I think, well, I think we can talk about sort of the first question there. It's like, sure. with that, what, is there anything that additional that anyone would like to see about <clears throat> the current sharing that's just created impacts with that? Before. I think it's broadly what I expected. Yeah, yeah. It, it's actually quite shocking how much we can't do. And it's yeah. really nice. Thank you so much for like bulleting that because I, I hadn't thought of some of the stuff that's very disappointing. Uh, I think it's worth pointing out also for people if, if anybody has ever been to Block and wondered why the BCS portables are six feet off the ground. Yeah. I think it's worth pointing out that um, since the block campus was built, a lot of block is now a floodplain due to the creek that's behind it. So when those portables, and this is ancient history at this point, but when the board originally agreed to put BCS on block, they didn't realize that those portables were going to have to be six feet off the ground, and it made it a lot more expensive. And so to Sandra's comment about if we were going to try to redevelop to somehow add six feet to block, that I I don't know for sure, but I suspect that that would trigger a whole bunch of other stuff. Basically, everything you added, every portable you drop on that site would have to be six feet off the ground. You can imagine the volume of concrete. Um, so it's just sort of there's an extra barrier there, I think, to doing something sort of as simple as like what the high school has been doing, which is drop portables in a corner and then I mean simple. That's a five year impact on the campus, <laughs> but it's even less simple. Um, the other question I had. Um, going actually back to your update on the facilities master plan process. Yeah. Do you know when there's going to be a presentation to the board? On April 1st. April 1st. Yep, we okay. had our planning meeting with them today and we figured we thought about the 18th, but it would be nice for them to have completed all of the site visits. So we decided on the 1st. Okay. That's for you all. And there would be no polling? Okay. No, but it's April 1st. Oh, no, no <laughs> joke about that. <laughs> <laughs> She's here all night. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, okay. So that, because, and this maybe does bleed over into the next action item, but in terms of next steps around making decisions around campus allocation, yes. I don't know that I see, and I'm curious to know what my fellow board members think. I don't know that I see. Sort of an opportunity for us to like take an action related to any of this stuff before we get the results of those at a minimum before we sort of get the results of, of the work that's been going on with this facilities master plan yeah that will give you the bigger picture yeah so i don't know the results of the work going on well so the, the facilities master plan one Oh, I see. Development that's going yeah. on because we had we had some <clears throat> had some questions from the public about are you guys were we going to make a decision tonight when are you going to make a decision and so in my mind it's certainly sort of no earlier than April first and okay. maybe not that early but which is I mean there's only one meeting between now and April first so it's not that much of a push out. 
without hearing a lot of pushback on that, I think we can sort of communicate that to any interested parties because that'll be the next major checkpoint around that stuff. So yeah, yeah why don't we go ahead and save the date? Yeah. <laughs> Unless anyone has anything to this and we can always come back if people have thoughts. So I want to move on to the next I4 agenda item, right. LASD and BCS discussions. I don't know if you want to set the table here, Sandra. Uh, absolutely. So at our last meeting, as part of this item, um, the temp site update, I believe we, um, you gave some direction for our um, discussion team. I don't know what the right language is, but for Shally and Jessica, subcommittee, I think. our superintendent <laughs> subcommittee of uh, Shally and Jessica, who um, had an opportunity to meet with several trustees. Um, from the charter school to talk about um, facilities. And so we did that. <laughs> and, uh, by Friday, we had a Zoom meeting on Friday of that week. So was it the ninth or something like yeah. that? Um, anyway, we had a meeting. I um, we communicated to them exactly what went on in our. Um, our meeting. Uh, I let them know that a majority of the board um, liked uh, putting them at the tenth site exclusively with a neighborhood preference um, um, and 900 students. And I said a majority of, of uh, the board um, wanted uh, to not be sharing um, at the tenth site, I mean, at the uh, Egan and Block. Um, anymore because it's just really uh, even without this we anecdotally knew that a lot of the sharing was taking um, a lot of time resources etc uh, from our district and wasn't allowing us to move to the uh, sixth grade middle school um, model and um, I also uh, let them know um, again about the sixth grade model that we all actually want the want sixth grade to be moving to the middle school. Um, I did inform them that we um, we had read their email there that um, they had wanted to stay at Egan and Gosh, um, uh, with better facilities um, and that uh, you know so having said that I said we're kind of at opposing sides as it relates to a majority um, of our our board uh, to let you know who participated on their side we had um Sai Fahimi uh Shrut uh Kiki um and Andrea Irene um, from their board I'm technically not trustees board uh we're elected um and uh uh, anyway, so we had that discussion. It took a while for us to just get to a point where we were kind of trying to meet somewhere um, in the middle. Um, it was more like selling selling each one of our uh, you know, sides of, of what we liked more. Mm -hmm. um, but in the end, we did start talking about um, Okay. <laughs> um, it, at uh, closer to the end of the conversation, we uh, did come to a point where we talked about okay. Well, we also, as our board, did talk about side trim, but also small trim uh, footprint at one of our uh, junior highs. And once uh, we brought that up, it became a little uh, a easier conversation um, with them, um, and that is where we left it. I said, uh, you know, I'd bring it, uh, the discussion back to our, our board um, and they would do the same. They're meeting tonight also. Um, so that's uh, where we are at. I have, we have asked for an in-person meeting um, for our next meeting um, after this one. Um, and it may not be this week, but it could be next week, but we'll, we'll see how we put it together. Nothing bad. Yeah. Nothing bad. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, question? Yeah, I, I do have one. Yeah. Um, so <clears throat> that's a tenth site discussion. We we did also have an ongoing agreement with them yes. that expires. Yes. Is that, did that come up in this conversation yet, or are we going to try to do that live? Um, we I think it was. Well, we didn't explicitly yeah. say say that. 
I think I, I just remember talking about the different solutions more so than what what it came up, but it, it was the idea that we should try to come up with an agreement because Prop 39 sucks yeah, for us all. Exactly. Is is the gist of it. Yeah. Um, so, so no no in depth conversation. No in depth because we were too at the beginning of it too far away from where so, we were standing. And then we finally got to a spot and then we all had lives we had to get into. So the conversation is so perhaps that could be some yeah. direction yes. that comes tonight. Right. To yeah. Well, yeah. yeah. So yeah. before we get to discussion, do we have any requests for public comment on this one? Okay. Yeah. So we can proceed with board discussion. Further questions? I, I, I think I asked for uh, the letter that was sent by BCS to the LASD to be put into the public record. Okay. And I don't know if that's been done or not. In the minutes. So there's a the the pertinent whole. portion is in the minutes. Thank you. Yeah. I saw that. I'm like, huh? Oh, yeah, part of the Okay. Um, well, you were there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, do you have any discussion? So um I think my comment is that sort of I think Sandra's presentation on the last item in terms of the sharing and the impact of that, I think makes clear why we need to sort of back away from the status quo. But also I think the, um, I don't know, if it's too, it's probably too early for us to come up with sort of a number, maximum number that we would be willing to have remaining as sharing on Black and Egan. But it's clear to me that that number is gonna be pretty small. Um, like, you know, closer to 200 students than 500 students, mm -hmm. for example. Yeah. Um, and yeah. I think it might be interesting to consider what is the definition of sharing, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is it uh, just that they occupy well, and, space? Right. Yeah. That's and that's sorry. Yeah. That's, yes. And, and it's clear to me that that's what we were talking about. The sharing is like a small chunk with a firm border, and none of the sort of coordination that we've been sort of. Yeah, we we having sat through those conversations, unfortunately, with kind of just where we are today. Um, it was a lot of conversation back and forth about um, open space class control, and that's why we have to be sharing all this, um, because we can't, we just don't have the grassland to right. dedicate to both programs. Yeah. That's the idea of moving to separate campuses, made much, much more so. But, um, and to sidestep that issue, that's how we got to this very convoluted looking models, to be honest with you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Department. No, I know. But for Spending as much money as we're going to be spending to solve the solution. It's got to be solved. Um, I mean, in terms of the, so I don't know if there's any sort of direction that you guys feel you need at this point or if it's still too early in the um, discussion. I mean, I sort of, I, for the reason that I sort of just talked about in terms of floodplain to me having them stay on vegan seems more tenable to me than stay on block but i don't know that i insist on that if there's a plan a workable plan that could be they can come up i i wonder if it would be helpful to think of some next steps um for the board to get a rundown of if i don't even know the answer to this at each school site, what portables do we own? What are we leasing? Uh, how old are they? <laughs> kind of general condition, because I believe the ones at Block are much newer. We put in eight to $10 million or something like that to build that small campus. And I think the ones at Egan are 20 plus years old. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a factor for consideration and some work that we could do and bring back. Well, and I'd also like validation of the assertion that I made about construction um, at block having to be six feet off the ground. And so yeah. I, I do, I would ask that we make sure that our FMP consultants yeah. are kind of aware of that issue yeah. and sort of factor that in to yeah. any discussion of the future of that campus is sort of, is there in fact something that would trigger sort of a need to put everything on stilts. Right. I have a question um, along the lines <laughs> of getting direction. I mentioned that I did 
we did ultimately communicate to them that what about the small footprint. Uh, in that discussion, they their pie in the sky was 600 uh, students at um, uh, the, the 10 sites and then the rest of the population, which is 500. So I guess we need to know, like, at least, uh, I guess you had said maybe the 200 footprint. I, I guess I, I need to know what we should consider back. I, I don't know the definition of small. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Well, if their current population is still 100, then they're not planning to expand. Yeah. And if we can get 900 safely on the 10 site, we can put that in yeah. mind, is what I was always thinking. Um, and I definitely would like us to kind of work toward that. If we can. And it's back to the, the more we can create space on our campuses, the more we can afford things that we're not doing today. Yeah. And that's why I'm going to split between two campuses, three campuses, maybe. It doesn't make sense to me. Mm -hmm. um, and just trying to keep them to a, a minimum footprint off what comes to the main site would be what we could get to. The date for the next meeting. Yeah, right. <laughs> yes, I wish I could just make that happen. Yeah. There's film with everyone. Do you want to try to have this next meeting with them before our next meeting? And I don't want to schedule this like five or six weeks out. Like, yeah. You know, yeah. yeah. I want to try to get it next week if at all, yeah. all possible. And I mean, we yeah, can earlier is always, always better. Yeah. Yeah. The reason why it wasn't this week is that we were trying to make this in person, and one of the persons uh, is not here for this week. Okay. Try our hardest. Yeah. I mean, thank you guys for <laughs> taking the brunt of the uh, discussion. I mean, I guess the only other comment I would make is that <clears throat> once they can get to a point of sort of actually looking at what their needs are, I think there's a lot of potentially moving parts and middle ground and everything else but they have, so they have to take our needs seriously and really look at their needs not their wants uh, which is how they tend to look at facility stuff all right awesome. thank, you. thank you okay we'll now move on to i5 the second interim financial report you guys can't wait for that. That's <laughs> <laughs> wow, this is the best player in the room. So, uh, good evening. Thank you. Um, tonight's our opportunity to provide the board uh, an update of our second interim financials. And this is all of our uh, expected revenue and expenditures from the beginning of July 1st through January 31st. And uh, this starts our interim presentation tonight. So any uh, changes since first interim, uh, we uh, a very small decrease in property tax, only $2,000. Our in lieu transfer to BCF is a decrease of $212,000. And that's due to the uh, COLA that's expected um, every year when we budget. We think the COLA is going to be a certain number. So we have to wait till the state releases their COLA for next year. So our transfer next year will slightly decrease. We have local revenue increase, which is some donations and interest. Uh, we budget very low for interest. Um, and as the interest payments start coming in from the county, we adjust our budget accordingly. Uh, significant savings, a lot of unfilled vacant positions that we closed. Um, we keep them open usually until a little bit past September and January. And if we're not going to do any hiring, we close the positions and that's a significant savings. Uh, not just the salaries, but all the benefits in retirement as well. So there's a significant savings. Uh, we slight decrease in our supplies and contracted services, money to allocate and budget there, and we're not anticipating spending. And then our contribution to the cafeteria fund is a decrease of about 220000 Some of that is some of the, um, when we adopt our budget, we don't really know what the reimbursement rates are, so we're a little conservative in our, in our adjustment, in our uh, 
expectations. And so there's a little bit of a decrease or contribution. So our general fund revenue assumptions uh, added to option last May, which is almost a year ago. Uh, we predicted in our, our assumption was about a five and a half percent property tax growth. And we really rely on the county assessor's office. Uh, they do a great job giving us good information and we adjust our budget accordingly. So right now we're expected uh, our revenue and the receipts have been coming in. We're about 5.72. That number has held very steady since December. It has not really changed at all. Our parcel tax is generating 9.5 million. Guaranteed CA, we receive ongoing mandated block grant. Prop 30 is, is now really called Prop 55. And it's education, <laughs> yeah. Helpful. It's now called the it's the education protection account uh, that actually expires in 2030. So that will be something that is money that comes in every year, and that's based on we get money per pupil, two hundred dollars per pupil. And it's, so it fluctuates every year based on our ADA. Uh, lottery unrestricted is a slight increase. Um, I'm not sure if everybody's playing Powerball or what's going on, but we um, our lottery is a little bit higher than we thought. It would be about 559,000. It's up to 605. That's unrestricted, um, and our property tax is a slight decrease to uh, PCS. Now, not included in our estimate, uh, and I believe we just got our, our money uh, came in last week, but we only report up to January 31st is our Prop 28. That's about three hundred ninety thousand dollars. It's not included in second interim. We will show it on the books when we close the books in June, but we also don't have, still haven't received the audit guidelines uh, from the state. We are hoping to get those sometime in March or April, and then we'll put a plan together, bring it to the board for the use of those funds. And that's ongoing money as well every year. Uh, it will go down a little bit based on our AD and that duplicated people count. Uh, this hasn't really changed much. 92% uh, of our revenue is local in nature. That's property taxes and the parcel tax. That will change slightly next year. Uh, thank goodness uh, for Measure A passing. So we'll get a little bit extra bump in our parcel tax revenue. And that's great. And you can see federal and state funding is a very small part of our revenue for our district. Local property taxes, this is really from first interim. Uh, really no changes from the assessor's office in our, in our uh, assumptions for the year. Slight increase in HOX is homeowner exemptions, uh, but a very slight decrease from the assessor's office. Uh, and if there's any changes between now and the end of the fiscal year, it's really going to be anybody selling their homes. And then we get a little extra supplemental tax coming in, but there probably won't be too many of those changes. But as we know, uh, fall and winter, home, uh, home sales are usually a lot lower. And as we get into spring and summer, we hope that home sales will tick up. And then there's been talk that the Federal Reserve might be lowering interest rates, but it might not happen until into the third quarter of the year, which would be after our fiscal year closes. Three-year summary of property taxes. As you can see, it lat, uh, from 21-22 to 22-23, significant property tax increase. Con was doing really well. Then inflation kind of came in. Federal Reserve raised interest rates to slow down the economy and slow down inflation. You can see uh, that is impacting. Still great growth, 5.72% growth, but with all the pressures on uh, wages and inflation, we, we really needed to see if we could uh, find another way to uh, really be mindful of our expenses because our, our growth is really not going to grow. Our revenues have to grow as fast as our expenses. Some general fund expenditures uh, in our budget uh, this year was a 6% increase for uh, CSE, LAT, and management. Step and column is about $500,000 uh, for all groups. And that's every year. If there are no raises, it's still going to cost us about 500,000 people step in column. I wanted to point out one thing. Uh, uh, our health and welfare benefits went up 244,000. And that was from July 1, a significant increase in uh, Kaiser, 13% uh, across the board. And then also our PGE, as, as everybody's been seeing their bills that they get at their homes. Well, the district has PGE bills as well, and we're seeing a significant increase in our utilities. So we're being very mindful of health and welfare benefits and utilities, because those are pretty big expenses for the district. This is the cafeteria fund. You can see um, federal revenue uh, is a slight decrease, and then uh, state revenue is actually an increase. So it's, it's, a, it's a nice change for us, and then some of our expenses uh, have decreased a little bit. So our contribution at first interim was 1.1, uh, and we're feeling okay with our revenue coming in. And this is really the reimbursement rates. Uh, we will close the books at the end of uh, June, and all the money won't have not gotten to us yet. Because usually when you do a claim for reimbursements from federal uh, government and from the state, it takes a couple months to get, get us the, the revenue. But this is what our expected revenue 
on expenditure. There are there's a decrease of general fund contribution to the cafeteria fund, but still significant. Nine hundred thousand is still significant contribution from a general fund. That money could be used for salaries and benefits for employees, um, and it's a great thing. We we had a, um, a presentation last week for the wellness committee, and I think we've served over two hundred and fifty thousand meals this year, which is great for our kids and some of our neediest kids get those meals. So it's just it's a great program, but there's a cost to that program. Special education contribution. Uh, we got an increase, in, uh, and I'll talk a little bit about later tonight. The special ed transportation uh, will be approving a plan uh, for next year, uh, but we do get a little extra special ed transportation. That's what some of the extra revenue is there on the top category, and uh, a slight decrease in salary and benefits, uh, but a little bit of increase in all other. All other is um, our special ed uh, transportation and non-public schools, so that it's very expensive. If students, um, if we have to send them to a non-public school, we have to pay that. And that's a significant uh, increase for us as well. Multi-year projection. So not only are we, do we have to look at this year, but we have to look at the next two subsequent years. So this is our multi-year projections. Property tax growth for this year is we're predicting 5.72. Uh, we were, we're already getting numbers and what they call that is the rural growth for next year. And next year we're looking at about 4%. Uh, and we'll have one more property tax meeting in early May, and that will give us kind of our number that we're going to we'll build into our budget. But at this time, we're looking at about a 4% property tax growth, and then the third out year at 3%. Our particle tax was $9.5 million, and then uh, there was a correction that, and I thank you, Marcy, for giving out the slides. There are a couple of corrections. One of them was on this slide and the special ed one. But this was in next year, uh, because of measure A passing, there'll be an increase of extra uh, revenue for the district up to 10.4, and then because of the 4% COLA in 25-26, it'll be 10.5 million. And we're also basing on the assumption there'll be an increased number of parcel tax exemptions as well. So we're, we try to do that. Um, when we get into July 1st, uh, we'll say how many parcel tax exemptions were this year for seniors, and then we, we make an assumption for the following year, and then starting July 1, we'll give our numbers to the county. Uh, no major other changes uh, next year. We're predicting uh, that we'll have to transfer our property tax in lieu to BCS at 10.6 million. And that is not the significant increases that we've been seeing. And the reason is because COLA it is hard to believe. Last year's COLA across the state was 8.22. This year or next year, their state is looking at 0.76, so less than a percent for COLA. Uh, and that does impact on some of our categoricals that we receive but not so much anything else. So COLA is gonna be something you're gonna be hearing about um, from many districts across the state. Uh, if your expenses are going up four or 5% and you're only getting um, 0.76 COLA and you're also declining enrollment ADA, many school districts are, are, are seeing significant cuts next year. So we're uh, trying ourselves to be very mindful of those things, looking at cutting our expenses and our costs. Uh, Step and column in the multi-year is, is over $500,000 a year uh, this year. Uh, and I really want to use the word right side staffing. That has been our word. Uh, we really did that this year. We met all of our targeted reductions. Uh, that's why our financials are much better uh, shaped than they were at adoption. Um, we really did. We reduced over 18 FTEs. Uh, many of them were through attrition, retirement, as people left. We really looked at ourselves and then, in fact, I mentioned earlier tonight, we had a lot of vacant positions as people, uh, we couldn't find someone or they retired. We said, hey, do we really need to backfill that position and really wanted to applaud uh, our whole team, uh, HR and all the departments and program managers uh, because we really are working closely together to make sure we meet those targeted goals. Next year, we'll, we haven't determined how many FDE changes there will be, but we're gonna continue looking at that and being very mindful of staffing uh, and if somebody retires or leaves, really look at our staffing levels to make sure we're not overstaffed. Health and welfare, uh, we will adopt our budget at 7.5%, but there are certain years, uh, health and welfare goes up 5%. Last year was up 13%. So every year we want to take an average. Uh, then um, once we get our numbers, usually in the fall, we'll adjust our budget next year, uh, starting January 1 of 25. Multi-year revenue, you can see revenue is flattening out a little bit, and that's because property tax growth is not going to be going up as much. Our federal revenue is a very small percentage of our budget. State revenue, uh, you'll see a decline, and that's because some of the one-time funds that we received this year won't be carried forward 
uh, over a million of that was the art music discretionary block grant. You can see the increase in our uh, parcel tax, and I'll fix that last slide, Jessica. Uh -huh. five, five. Um, but other local revenue, you can see that also uh, in the multi-year, we, we see it being pretty flat. Other local revenue, interest, fees, rentals, uh, and donations. Uh, most state revenue is going to be our ELOP, lottery, mandated block grant, things like that. Multi-year expenditures. Uh, the other financing, that's the transfer out to the cafeteria fund. And you can see this year of almost 900000 But in the multi-year, we know costs are going to be going up. Uh, so we, uh, in our multi-year, we're predicting a little bit over a million dollars. And as information changes, we'll adjust accordingly. Uh, this is always a, a really good slide. You can see within the belt tightening, we've really been able to get our budget kind of dialed in. Um, our fund balance this year, we're anticipating a reduction of a, a little under, little, a uh, little over three point two million dollars. But I want to emphasize that fund balance is restricted funds. And so when you look at that, uh, it doesn't mean we're like deficit spending for this year. It means some of those funds might not be all spent, and some of those are restricted funds. We have about 800,000 educator effectiveness. We have a little over $1 million in um, the art music discretionary block grant. So just those two things alone is almost $2 million. So we're really, we know we won't spend all that till the end of the year, but it is in our budget as expenditures. And so that will increase our fund balance. We won't go uh, to the, a deeper deficit. And then in next year's um, uh, fund balance, uh, really almost a quarter million dollar deficit, which is is very uh, good belt tightening. And that's based on some staffing reductions, uh, revenue increases, and trying to really be tighter with our staffing. Uh, but you can see in the multi-year, uh, just a little bit of an under a million dollar deficit projected. Uh, and our reserves are in a much healthier place than they were really at the beginning of the year. So we're really excited um, and thankful for our staff of making some really good sacrifices. Um, we try to do more with less. And sometimes it's not the thing to do. People do get a little uh, tired of doing that, but we're really thankful. Um, really, everybody's really been chipping in. So it's been a team effort from all the departments and program managers. So we're really excited. Um, oh. And then these are the key budget deadlines we'd like to share with you tonight. We're here. Second interim is March 15th. Uh, there'll be some site budget allocations. Uh, hard to believe after this meeting, we're going to be planning for um, uh, we have our budget review committee. First meeting will be this Thursday. So we're going to start really building our budget for next year. Uh, and then uh, when this year is closed out, we'll bring back the unaudited actuals uh, in September. And a final audit report will be uh, by the end of the year. <laughs> a lot of information. I'll try to go as quick as I could. So i uh, here to answer any questions for you. Great. Any clarifying questions? Any request for public comment? <laughs> Any further board discussion? Anyone would like to make a motion? Since this is an action item, we need to approve. So moved. Can we get to the motion to approve the second interim financial report made by Shally, seconded by Steve? Any further board discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes five now. <clears throat> Moving on to item I6, resolution 23 slash 24 dash 11, authorization to increase decrease income and expenditures. Yes, this is a routine item that we have every year uh, at first and second interim is to balance our budgets. That's many of them are restricted funds. We have to balance all those. Uh, and this will, is an authorization of resolution 2324-11 to increase and decrease any expenditures in all the budgets. And then after the board approves it, then tomorrow morning we'll make the approved budget transfers. And this is an action item. Yep. Any clarifying questions? Any requests for public comment? Any further comments? Yeah, I don't understand. This, and I got you on the channel also. So I'm going to vote against it. Good Would anyone like to make a motion to approve resolution 23 slash 24 11? So moved. Yeah. Yeah. 
Motion to approve the resolution made by Shelley, seconded by Vladimir. No. Or by yeah. Steve. You were in my mind. I know. <laughs> seconded by Steve. Who sits next to Vladimir? Who sits next to Vladimir? Any further board discussion? By <laughs> <laughs> okay. You guys look a lot alike. This is call. I need to roll call this vote. Steve. Uh, yes. Vladimir. Nay. Shally. Yes. Jessica. Yes. I also vote yes. Motion passes four to one. Moving on to I-7, approval of the 24, 2024 25 transportation plan. Sure. So last year, the school district and, and many school districts up and down the state was the first year of um, for all school districts were entitled to have transportation funds as part of the home and school transportation plan. So we, last year we actually had to adopt a two year plan and it was for the 20, it was for the 22, um, 23 and 23, 24 school year. This year we're, uh, we only have to do it one time now because we did the two year plan last year. We received these funds on the end of the year. Um, and so this is going to be the plan for next year. Uh, we won't receive these funds for next year's plan until the end of next June. Um, so we've already approved last year's plan. This is an annual requirement in order to receive the funds. Um, and so we're asking the board tonight to approve the 24-25 transportation plan for the district. Um, no major changes to the plan other than our, our funding uh, changes are slightly, we'll have a slight increase for this year's plan, for next year's plan rather. Great. Any questions? Does this cover all of our transportation? It does not cover it all. Any requests for public comment? Any further board discussion? <clears throat> Would any board members like to make a motion to approve the 2024 so transportation plan? I'll second. Motion to approve the plan made by Vladimir, seconded by Shali. Any further board discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, motion passes five to nothing. By eight. Who will contract with Atlas Technical Consultants? Yes, this is an independent consulting agreement for geotechnical services for the 10th site. This is required for the uh, uh, DSA uh, to submit drawings to DSA. And, and a lot of the work is for the underground exploration. There'll be some boring done. And in the actual agreement, it talks about the scope of what exactly what they'll be doing. Um, uh, about a year ago, the district uh, created a pool of geotechnical consultants. We did an RFQ. Uh, geotechnical firms submitted their proposals. Um, we created a pool of geotechnical companies. Uh, and then on this particular project, we asked them to submit proposals. We received three proposals. They're all very, uh, very similar in, in scope and price. Uh, Atlas Technical Consultants is a very well-established firm. They were able to meet our timeline to start work on the project as soon as the board gives approval. Uh, the pr proposal tonight for $32,850. We're asking the board to approve this contract tonight for 10 site geotechnical services. Any questions? <laughs> Just to clarify, Eric, this is, you said DSA approval. So this is separate from the CEQA work that we've done on the site. Cor correct. This is correct. And a lot of the work is perceived the type of soil. And then that makes the structural engineers have to design the foundations and footings a certain way. So a lot of this work has to be done really before we even submit to, to DSA. That's correct. Mm -hmm. so, and it's not it's not in part of the CEQA documents. That must be. So this is, I mean, different work than what we've done as part of developing the CEQA. Okay. Any questions for public comment? <laughs> Any further board discussion, or would someone like to make a motion? Um, I'll make the motion. To? To uh, approve the agreement with Atlas Technical Consultants, LLC, for geotechnical engineering services. <laughs> really, two districts work at the proposed site. Further, oh, sorry, further board discussion. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Um, last board meeting, I asked these reports, these uh, contracts be filled out completely. and. All the people working on the contract are empty. So I'm going to vote now. We have a motion? I oh, make the sorry. motion to approve. Further, sorry, sorry. I'll second it. Do we have further discussion? 
Okay. Motion to approve the contract for that and the consultants made by Shelly, seconded by Jessica. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Opposed. Motion passes four to one. <clears throat> aye nine. Amendment number one, the community services agency lease agreement. Sure. Um, many months ago, the board approved a, um, a lease agreement with community services agency, which provides uh, food and clothing um, for many of our community members that live in uh, Mountain View in the North Los Altos area. Uh, and they are leasing a part of the 10 site with the Joanne Fabrics. Uh, community Ser Service Agency asked us if uh, they could lease a different part of the property, which has a freezer and walk-in cooler, uh, so they could actually offer more perishable foods for the community members. Uh, we worked with Federal Realty, which is the property manager at the site, uh, and we were able to get access to do some inspections. And we found out the, uh, the noodle house uh, was actually a suitable location, and the freezer and walk-in cooler actually works. Uh, and then CSE asked us if we could lease um, another part of the property to them. And we said, absolutely. Uh, we're great community partners with CSEA. So tonight we're asking the board to approve amendment number one uh, with community service agency to at least some additional space at the Penn site. Good question. Question action yeah. I have some actually questions. When do we expect them to be actually moving into the space? It's a great question. Mm -hmm. uh, they are dealing with the city of Mountain View and permitting. Uh, so they are doing some permitting with the city of Mountain View for their tenant improvements. Uh, and all the tenant improvements are on their dime. Uh, but they are going to be uh, trying to get all their permits done through the city of Mountain View. So we're hoping that they will get that done soon so they can start moving in there as soon as they can. Who owns the freezers? Who owns the freezers? The Los Altos School District owns the freezers. Yeah, we own the ten site, and so uh, this is a um, part of the property that's not being utilized or used. So we felt it would be perfect for them to be able to use it for their um, for their program. If I remember correctly, they're leasing it for a dollar or Correct. not even a dollar. Correct, a dollar in exchange for having all the liability. Correct. Yeah, they'll have to pay all the ten improvements will be on community services and utilities as well. And flexibility for when we have to start constructing. Correct. Yeah, and they know they know that uh, as long as we give them a, enough notice, they can vacate the property. Okay. Any requests for public comment? All right. <clears throat> Any further discussion? Nope. Would anyone like to make a motion to approve Amendment Number One of the Community Services Agency? So I'll second. Motion to approve the amendment made by Vladimir, seconded by Shali. Uh, assuming no further board discussion, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, motion passes 5 nothing. I-10, <laughs> resolution 23-24-12, elimination of classified services for the 2024-25 school year. Yes, so tonight, you heard a little bit from Eric around second interim. Um, as we continue to look closely at our finances. Uh, you know, we've been operating in a budget deficit. We have talked about um, the increased staff to meet the needs of our students and community during the pandemic. So as we've been looking to right size, we've been looking very closely at different um, job groups across our district. Um, our want is to be able to make those um, changes through natural attrition and we've been able to do so much of that but you do remember last year we brought to you at this time last year um, the laying off of uh, two LVN positions um, which due to really a, a lack of work and lack of funds because they were being paid by COVID money. Um, this is true when I think of our positions here tonight. So I wanna talk about um, the reduction in uh, 1.5 positions, which is really two people, two wonderful people who've worked with us um, as custodians in our district. Um, we increased our custodial staff fairly significantly throughout the pandemic. They were, they were being paid for with COVID funds. You know that those COVID funds are no longer there. Um, and we are, we have been able to capture some through attrition, but this helps us get back to our right side staffing, which is still 
fairly generous staffing because of the reduction in enrollment. We don't have as many classrooms being filled um, with kids as we did pre-pandemic. Um, so we are looking at a reduction in 1.5 FTE in custodial staff. Um, in addition to a new position this year, which is our district wellness coordinator, this is a position that is partially funded by a grant from the county for um, school-linked services. Um, and as we've looked closely at that position this year and want to thank our wellness coordinator for her great work, um, it's become clear to us that we don't have um, the amount of work required for a full-time person in this position. We have a lot of duplication of work between our student and staff services division, our um, uh, community facilitator position, and uh, the district pays more than 50% of this position. It's not fully covered by the grant monies that we do get from the state. So um, we are looking at that one, time, uh, one FTE reduction in the wellness coordinator position. Like Kimberly said, these are people and it's hard to make these um, decisions. Um, We've had lots of conversations with the individuals and uh, obviously thank them and wish them well and hope that they can find a, a position that fits their qualifications in the future. Um, they've done great work for us. And um, tonight we're asking for you to pass this resolution. Great. Sorry, final questions? Oh, yes. one. And just to confirm the wellness coordinator, um, we still have, so we're, so our portion of the money is what we're saving, but do we still have the grant from the county to pay? We will still okay. get grant money for that portion of the position. Yes. Perfect. Yep. And you talked about duplication. So is there a sense of like, if we're reducing by one FTE, like what percentage of an FTE reduction in sort of services reaching our families mm -hmm. is there? Mm -hmm. I don't know that I could quantify it. I, I can tell you generally that we have um, Claire Crane, who's been working closely with our mental health counselors across the board and helps manage the services for mental health. We have um, Abel Velasquez, who is working very closely with our families. Um, I believe Claire is going to take on some of the responsibility. She has time in her schedule to do some of the school linked services like the Medicaid. We have just a handful of families who um, require that services and we want those services and we want to make sure that we have greater access. So we're really looking to see um, Abel's position more visible in the community to make sure that we're casting as broad a net as possible. Jennifer Kiker, before um, our wellness coordinator was a position, Jennifer Kiker was also doing some of those um, linked services, frankly. <laughs> um, so we're looking as a team of how we might make sure that we're not losing out on the services, we're able to save the money and ensuring that our families have what they need. Is, is this sort of another case where, you know, during COVID, when kids were off campus for so long, we really needed lots of extra headcount to sort of go out and make contact with families and I, find in a way that's not quite as necessary when, now that people are back? Or... I think it was more, um, we had a grant opportunity um, for a portion of this position, and wouldn't it be great to make this a full-time position? And then in reality, it's not a full-time position worth of work for us, especially with the other pieces that have been in place for longer. Gotcha. Okay. Any other questions or discussion? Okay. Um, this is another action item. So someone would like to make a motion to approve resolution 22 slash 24 dash 12. So moved. I'll second. Motion made by Vladimir, seconded by Shali. Uh, we have to call this one as roll call vote again. So, Steve? Yes. Vladimir? Yes. Charlie? Yes. Jessica? Yes. I vote yes. Motion passes 5 to 11. Um, just out of curiosity, why roll call vote? It's a resolution. Resolutions. It's a resolution. Really? Okay. Thank you. 
Okay. Ten years on the board. <laughs> Just found that out. Oh, okay. So this is new. Yeah. Okay. So the next meeting we have to go back, call the roll, pressure. That's what you remember. <laughs> 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 um, I-11-2024 CSBA Delegate Assembly. Yes, so in your packet um, was, finally, we got it, um, the ballot for and the information on the candidates running for the Delegate Assembly for our county. Um, you can vote for no more than four candidates. I hope that you were able to read through. Sometimes there's been some sharing of opinions around here as um, who you may vote for. There are five uh, candidates running for four steps. There were speeches at the last SEC and CA meeting a few candidates. Okay. Uh, any requests for public comment? <laughs> Any board discussion? It's so awkward. Oh, so, we have yeah, yeah. 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 following along at home. Yeah. For Jessica yeah. and Shelly. Right. I really recommend Shelly. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, we, two, two, of the, two of the candidates are, you know, I hope you'll vote for the two on your board. <laughs> <laughs> Um, may I recommend that you consider voting for the current leadership of the Santa Clara County School Boards Association, where Jessica is the president, Carol Prezunka is the vice president, and I am the treasurer. Um, and my Jessica rolls on board, Carol and I will roll up. So we, so. That would be one way to look at this. So you got three. There. You got three. So you need a fourth. And uh, it's a hard one for us to say because yeah. actually the, every last person on this list would be a great choice. One, for sure. Every last for sure. one of those women are great. Um, I I don't want to make the choice on, on that. But we'll go with No men? Yeah. They're not, not on this round. There are men that are delegates. It's just not on this. Uh, this round, yeah, yeah. yeah no. um, I mean, it wasn't, I'm, as you say, I yeah. at least know of all of these people, and they all seem like yeah. good candidates. Um, nothing jumped out at me as far as geographic distribution or, or anything yeah. like that. Yeah. Um, we would not, I'd like to point out just for the record, I think even if we vote for both of you, yeah. That's not going to make LAFC the only district with multiple no. board members no. as delegate representatives. Correct. Um, <clears throat> so. And we are, to, while we are from Los Altos School District, we are representing uh, Region 20, but we are representing Santa Fe. And that is our job. We have to represent the entire thing. Right. Uh, so, are the mechanics of this house supposed to work? Um, well, we can vote for up to four. So the way this is, we've done this in the past is somebody may usually sort of agree amongst ourselves who we want to vote for, and then somebody makes a motion listing those four people, and then we vote yes or no based on that motion. Um, I mean, it's a vote up to four. If we can't choose, we could vote just for our colleague here and not for any of the other three. I was really hoping that somebody would not like one of the candidates. No, they're all, they're they're all, all really wonderful. And they've all got their individual strengths, which they would bring to the delegate assembly. Yeah. Steve, any thoughts? Um, yeah. To your point, that the idea that maybe we we have a succession of the three leadership at least should be both into the space. Maybe we only vote on three, uh, and because the other two kind of tie up for us. Um, I'm, I'm comfortable with that idea. Um, 
when I read the resumes and stuff, um, I kind of lead more towards Jordy, Jody, or Ben, your Ben, than I did the other one. But that was just me. Jody's an incumbent. He's an incumbent, uh, been doing it for many, many years, has a lot of experience. She knows how to do the job. I will move. We <laughs> vote for Jessica Spicer, Charlie Serke, Carol Kazaka, and Jody Murray. I would second that. Okay. Motion. The vote as such made by me, seconded by Steve. Any further board discussion? All in favor? Oh, no, we got to call the roll. Oh. Steve? Yes. Vladimir? I have seen. What happens? A little against our norm, but okay. Yeah. Shelly? Yes. Jessica? Yes. I vote yes. Motion passes 4 0 with one abstention. Vladimir? Sandra, anything? Board yeah. administration comments? Nothing to add at the moment. Okay. Steve? Yeah. Right. I went to some meetings. Oh, jeez. Charlotte? <laughs> uh, nothing to add at the moment. Jessica? Nothing to add at the moment. <laughs> I also have nothing to add. We are adjourned.